Good morning and welcome to day two. Uh, quick, just a couple quick reminders before we get started. Again, uh, check your electronic devices and make sure they're on silent mode. Um, the, uh, for the uh, photographer, again, for the students, uh, if you're out and about, please remove your, any kind of name tag when they take your question, uh, if they take, before they take your photo. Um, today's remarks, again, are on the record, so uh, keep that in mind. Um, there's a, uh, for today's schedule, there's a, pro there's, a, there's a slight program change. So I just want to make sure, uh, you know, after the panel speaks, we will break at 9.20, and that'll be uh, just a short 10-minute break to get, um, I mean, I'm sorry, after the keynote speech, there'll be a short 10-minute break to get the panel set up, and then we'll start. So it'll be a shorter break than normal, but uh, we'll have that break. And then um, after the panel, We'll have a 20-minute break that'll start um, at 10:50, uh, and uh, I, I just ask you to be in your seats by 11:10 uh, for the commandant. Uh, Q&A, the same as yesterday. Make sure you press and hold the microphone, uh, the button on the microphone in front of you, and um, and um, stand up, identify yourself, um, and then ask your question. And with that, I introduce you again to uh, the president of the Naval War College. Rear Admiral Shoshana Chatfield. Good morning, all. Thanks for coming in an energized and inquiring frame of mind. We had a great day yesterday, and I'm really looking forward to our speakers and panel today. For this next panel, our very own Dr. Jessica Blankshane an associate professor in national security affairs, will lead a discussion on challenges to American leadership. And uh, please, Dr. Blankshane, please introduce your panel and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Welcome back, everyone. I am delighted to serve as your moderator for today's panel on challenges to American leadership, featuring some truly brilliant and accomplished panelists. Uh, I can't possibly do justice to all of their achievements while still leaving time for them to present, so I will give some very brief bios before I turn it over to them. So, uh, right to my left, we have Dr. Sarah Kreps, who is joining us from Cornell University, where she is the John L. Wetherill Professor of Government, Adjunct Professor of Law, and Director of the Tech Policy Institute. She is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She previously served as an active duty officer in the United States Air Force. Dr. Krepp's research lies at the intersection of technology, politics, and national security. Her writing has been featured in a wide array of journals from Foreign Affairs to the New England Journal of Medicine. And she has been featured in media outlets including CNN, the BBC, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. The most recent of her five books is Social Media and International Relations, published in 2020 by Cambridge University Press. Next, we have Ms. Nadej Roland, who comes to us from the National Bureau of Asian, Asian Research, a DC and Seattle-based think tank, where she is Distinguished Fellow for China Studies. Prior to joining NBR, she served for two decades as an analyst and senior advisor on Asian and tri Chinese strategic issues to the French Ministry of Defense. Ms. Roland's research focuses on China's foreign and defense policy, grand strategy, and the articulation of China's vision of itself as a great power on the world stage. She is a prolific author and editor of reports on China's, China's global influence and is the author of the 2017 book, China's Eurasian Century, Political and Strategic Implications of the Belt and Road Initiative. Her work has appeared in a variety of international publications and she has been featured in numerous media outlets including The Economist, the BBC, and the Washington Post. Next up, we have Dr. Nadia Shadlow, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and co-chair of the Hamilton Commission on Securing America's National Security Innovation Base. Previously, she was U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategy. In that capacity, she led the drafting of the 2017 National Security Strategy. Earlier in her career, she served at DOD and then at the Smith Richardson Foundation, where she helped identify strategic issues that warranted attention from the US Policy Commission, 
from the US policy community. She also served on the Defense Policy Board and is a full member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Dr. Shadlow's research and analysis focuses on the intersection of strategy, national security, and technology. Her articles have appeared in a range of publications, including Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, and the Wall Street Journal. Her 2017 book from Georgetown University Press is titled War and the Art of Governance, Consolidating Combat Success into Political Victory. And last but not least, we have Dr. Toshi Yoshihara, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. He was previously the inaugural John A. Van Buren Chair of Asia Pacific Studies and a professor of strategy right here at the US Naval War College, where he was awarded the Navy Meritorious Civilian Award in recognition of his scholarship in 2016. He has also served as a visiting professor at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UCSD, and the US Air War College. He currently teaches a graduate course on sea power in the Indo-Pacific at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Dr. Yo Dr. Yoshihara has published numerous books, articles, and reports on strategy and naval power. The second edition of his book, Red Star Over the Pacific, China's Rise and the Challenge to US Maritime Strategy, which he wrote with the Naval War College's James Holmes, was published by Naval Institute Press in 2018 and is listed in a number of the uh, US uh, Joint Chiefs reading lists. And his latest book is Mao's Army Goes to Sea, The Island Campaigns and the Founding of China's Navy, published by Georgetown U University Press in 2022. And that is enough from me, so I will turn it over to Dr. Kretz. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here and a real honor. Uh, so I'm going to be talking this morning about uh, what I was asked to talk about and what I work on, uh, which is political, but this is a, 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 not a paraphrase. This was what I was asked to talk about, so I wanted to put it in the title. The political and economic restraints on American global power. And so what I'm going to do in these remarks is walk through a few uh, different steps of an argument. So first, I'm going to talk about global power. And I understand this came up yesterday. And so I'm not going to belabor this. I'm also not going to belabor the next part, which I understand is something that will be very familiar to this group and simpatico with this group, which is technology as power. And then stepping into uh, global competition as technology competition, kind of uh, Cold War 2.0 as, as a tech, tech competition. And then moving on to industrial policy. So this new set of policies that is uh, insisting not just that the US get ahead, but that it maximize its tech uh, rate of difference, uh, rate of growth difference over its competitors, and where that might actually provide economic restraints on US global power. And then thinking about alternatives and ways to maintain global power. So as a first step in that, uh, as kids these days do, I, uh, I turned to the uh, trusty chat GPT. <laughs> so, what? because I, I really wanted, to, I know what I think of as global power, but I thought, what does, what does, uh, what does chat GPT think about global power? And the good news was, as, it, as tends to happen with chat GPT, uh, and the internet in general, the one big con uh, confirmation bias engine, is that it told me what I wanted to hear, uh, which is this kind of long thing as it does, but then at the bottom, and not too far at the bottom, cultural influence, technological advancements, diplomatic relations, and the ability to promote norms and values all contribute to a nation's or gr uh, group's global power. So those of you in the audience who know about DIME, diplomacy, um, What's the I? This isn't a test. <laughs> yes. Uh, M and E, military and economic, we'll, we'll find that also very familiar. Um, and we know, again, sort of one of the things about ChatGPT tells us something that seems feasible, but in this case, I actually think that's right. Um, and it's validated by what we see here in the NDAA. So strategic competition, disruptive technologies like hypersonic weapons, AI, 5G and quantum computing. Again, I don't think this audience needs this argument to be made about the importance of technology in global power, but my point is we're seeing this all over the place. And so we wanna be mindful, we wanna take this all very seriously. 
And so we do. So again, you know, at the center of this, and this seems very micro, but it's really important here, the role of semiconductor chips. And this has become the center of AI. It's become the center of a lot of US industrial and economic and trade policy now. So the, the reason why semiconductor chips are so central here is that they're important not just for military, but economic and civilian advancement. And again, what we know from International Relations 101 is to the extent that a country is excelling economically, it's able also to fuel its military engine. But what we know here is that it's more than just a figurative military engine, that these, these chips are actually the source of a, an actual military engine. So they're really important. They're important military, militarily and they're important economically. And so we know not just, so, you know, so these chips are kind of a microcosm of this bigger question of technology, which is why is tech so important in this kind of global power setting? So the digital economy is worth 11.5 trillion and 15.5% uh, of global GDP. But what's even more important is the rate of growth. So when we think about tech competition, when we think about our, our uh, rivals uh, internationally, really the focus of that has been technology. And I, I would submit for good reason. So here, um, again, kind of coming to this almost case study of semiconductor chips, uh, you may have read recently about uh, NVIDIA, which is a, which had been in, um, in, until now a company that many people hadn't heard of. So NVIDIA makes uh, semiconductor chips, um, which were known, I think, to the gaming community, but now it's at the center of AI development. So NVIDIA makes a chip that now has, as you can see here, it now is the, uh, what is that, sixth largest company in the world by market cap. So that's huge, and it's an American company. And so again, it's important economically, but it's also important kind of in this broader set of questions, economically and peer competitors. So here, uh, again, I put this up here. I think this is maybe, it was surprising to me. I, again, was doing some digging on data. Um, this wasn't chat GPT, this is well-sourced data on the, so in terms of US exports, integrated circuits, these things here, which again are at the center of our military development and civilian development, um, is the fifth largest export in the United States. And so that's very significant, it's really, the point is, it's very important to US economic growth. But this also presents conundrums in terms of growth and competition. And so here is, uh, here's the challenge. So this is both kind of, again, this will be very familiar. Tech is an engine in military development. So in thinking about the role here in the third offset, again, I'm sure this is very familiar to this, um, the people in this auditorium. The robotics, 3D printing, big data, AI, this is a way in which the US can kind of maintain that strategic advantage. Um, so again, at the center of that, and we can see these key elements here, AI, AI and autonomy, chips then are at the center of that. And so it presents again kind of these, these uh, conundrums. And the conundrum, and, and I've thought about this, and, and our previous speaker probably has thought about this as a historian even more, but what has cre created challenges is uh, sort of in thinking about competition and how uh, the economy and global trade can be a rising tide that's lifting all boats, is that the US and China now have, through decades of globalization, developed a very kind of in, almost inextricably linked connection with each other. But now, increasingly, that relationship is cast as global uh, Cold War 2.0 uh, tech competition. And so tech containment now has very much become part of US strategy and US economic policy. And so the question and the provocation here 
um, is whether, and this is something again that you know, uh, Putin says that the nation, again, casting this as a race, whoever leads an AI will be the ruler of the world. Again, we know from the last speaker that Putin has a tendency to say very off the cuff, kind of sometimes inane things. But I don't, I, it overstates it a little bit, but the, again, the sort of view here is that AI and tech are central to how uh, globe, what global competition looks like in the 20, 21st century. Here's the conundrum. I talked about how circuits are the fifth largest export. But what you may, so 3.5% of exports, but what you might hopefully notice as a discerning uh, audience member is the large square of China as the largest importer of, the, of, of this technology. And again, as a policymaker, this really sets up a conundrum. So if the goal is to increase kind of the relative advantage, advantage relative to China, and the policy then is to restrict those exports, that also is going to have possibly some negative externalities for, for the US economy as a whole. Um, so what though this, or sort of where this policy has uh, arisen from is this view here that the US used to be uh, responsible for 37% of semiconductor manufacturing, uh, China was 0%, China's now a quarter compared to the US at 10%. And so there is very much this argument and imperative to increase resilience, right? And so the argument, so, you know, in terms of uh, federal spending on semiconductor research, it has been relatively flat. And so how does the U.S., again, kind of what happened in the, uh, in the pandemic is what if there are scenarios uh, where as we show here, Taiwan, which is responsible for 92% of the most advanced chips. We know that there are a lot of scenarios, uh, security scenarios involving Taiwan. So the push then in this arena is to reshore and bring resilience to this manufacturing of what, as I've been talking about, is, is the hub of both military and economic development. However, it has created very much a kind of zero-sum mindset. And so it's not, as Jake's, the National Security Advisor said recently, it's not enough to um, identify these other countries as uh, countries of concern, that the US needs to stay a couple generations ahead. And that has led to a very restrictive set of uh, export restrictions um, with respect to China. And so the policy that was outlined not too long ago was what uh, the National Security Advisor referred to as small yards and high fences. I have to make sure I get this right. So I found this very interesting, this um, metaphor, uh, that we need to go from a global economic order shift from the Parthenon up here to Frank Gehry as an architectural model. Now this may be um, a matter of, uh, of uh, personal taste. As you'll see, I think, I, 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 I don't have problems with the Parthenon, and I, I, was, re I was reading a little bit about the um, Frank Gehry architecture that went into a building at MIT, wherein MIT sued Frank Gehry because it was leaking. And I felt like that also was an interesting metaphor for why we might not throw the baby out with the bathwater here. So what he says is that the 21st century capitalism needs to change and that globalization hasn't worked and that we need to, given this foundational nature of certain technologies, maintain as large a lead as possible. And again, I, ha I go back to my early uh, international relations training about these debates about uh, relative gains and zero-sum game, and you know this is clearly kind of a zero-sum. You know whatever their gain is is to our detriment. So we need to kind of keep the competition as far behind as possible. Um, and so what that has created is this uh, a really a revival of industrial policy, which is the U.S. is engaging in a degree of protectionism to try to reshore U.S. manufacturing in this critical space of uh, semiconductor chips 
And it harkens back to previous, uh, previous eras where, um, and this was something that uh, countries in Asia had done in the 50s and 60s, is really kind of create incentives and investment in domestic manufacturing. But I think there's a real risk here, and this is where I think I, I, I want to move to uh, what I call the Greek revival and bringing the Parthenon back in here. So one of the concerns here is that these policies might be self-defeating. And what, what I've tried to paint is this picture where the economic fates of, of the U.S. and China, like it or not, are relatively integrated. And the U.S. economy depends on these um, economic gains from these uh, tech developments and tech exports. Um, so I think there's a real, and what we're seeing here too, is a real race to the bottom. So as the U.S. has engaged in these policies, Europe is saying, we're going to do this. Asia is saying, we're going to do this. Uh, allies from the Netherlands to Japan to Taiwan are saying, this is putting, this is putting us at a disadvantage as well. Um, and so again, sort of the question here is, is that, you know, was, was, was globalization entirely bad or were there ways to think about economic efficiencies where we might leverage those, also bolster U.S. economic industry and our tech industries and help uh, our allies who are also part of this global trade? Um, you know, just a sort of last point is there is some question about whether this, these restrictions um, even work. Sort of a history of 5G export restrictions is not necessarily indicative of uh, a success. So what might we think about if our goal is to maintain a, a robust economy, a robust technological advancement, and be resilient economically and in terms of this really key industry, an alternative that I think is starting to gain some traction, and rightfully so, is this idea of high-tech alliances and uh, what you may have heard of as friendshoring or reshoring, not reshoring, on um, nearshoring. So if you look here at the world of our uh, research and development, it turns out that the countries in that sort of upper right quadrant, which would be the good quadrant to be in, are all our friends and allies. And so the idea would be here that the, these high-tech alliances kind of uh, aligning with these countries and building resilience through those alliances might try to leverage the, uh, the, the issue of resilience, address the competitive aspect while not kneecapping U.S. industry. Uh, what you can also see here, again, um, on the left is that the U.S. and Europe used to be dominant in this space. No longer so, but we do have uh, allies and friends who have joined this space. So the idea of this high-tech alliance is, it's, is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, engage in more collaboration on science and technology, and embrace comparative advantage and the efficiency be benefits of trade while leveraging trust among our allies. Um, so I, I, I live in upstate New York. We have a lot of Greek revival houses. Um, so I, was, I got sort of thinking about a mini Greek revival. So this was just two days ago, um, as though the policymakers had uh, a preview of my slides, US to allow South Korea and Taiwan shipmakers to keep operations in China. Now that is a bit provocative, but what it suggests is that the world is not so black and white and that there is an argument to be made to uh, capacity building of allies like Taiwan, like South Korea, and I think that gestures in that direction. So the uh, upshot here uh, is that uh, the Parthenon has some enduring strengths uh, that we you know, have benefited as the United States as a global military power, as a global economic power from an economic order of globalization. And that there are good reasons to take resilience and risk mitigation seriously, um, but there are strategies that might involve um, in the, a strong economy and strong military, strong allies, meaning strong the U.S., and strong tech being a strong national power. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Ms. Roland. Thank you very much. Um, 
I'm very grateful and honored to uh, speak today as part of this conference and to share some thoughts about the nature of the challenge that the People's Republic of China poses to the American global leadership. It may be uh, difficult to imagine that the world as we know it could be replaced by something radically different. The U.S. has enjoyed three decades of unchallenged leadership, and for 70 years, liberal democratic norms and values have not only underpinned the American worldview and driven its defense and foreign policy agendas, but also to a considerable degree have shaped the international order we live in. America's success was never preordained, uh, not has it ever come without immense sacrifice. The U.S. emerged as a global power after winning a world war against fascist powers in Europe and in Asia. It asserted its global leadership after winning a four decades long competition against the Soviet empire. Not all world orders emerge out of war, however. Some may be the result of a relentless, painstaking, and very deliberate process of erosion. And I believe that the latter is the preferred option that Beijing has chosen as the course for its own rise to the top. Episodically, the Chinese leadership is gracing us with some remarkable clarity about its ambitions, aspirations, and purpose. At the end of 2017, Xi Jinping observed that the world is in a state of profound changes unseen in a century. He has since then repeated this phrase very often in his speeches, and I think it doesn't require a degree in Sinology to understand that the Chinese leader is anticipating a power transition that will see China replacing the US and becoming number one. Just like a century ago, the United States emerged as the dominant power while Britain receded. But what difference does it make uh, if the leader of the world is based in Zhongnanhai instead of in the White House. Let's consider this for a minute. In the aftermath of the Second World War, the U.S. had accumulated considerable power. What did it choose to do with it? It no longer felt able to sit back within its own borders. Instead, it felt compelled to reshape the world in ways that would be safer for itself more secure for its national interests, and consistent with its own values. As China's material power has grown considerably, it's now facing similar questions, even though obviously circumstances are very different. China is not emerging out of a total breakdown of the international system resulting of a world conflict. It is emerging into a world that is still dominated by others. For decades following Deng Xiaoping's advice, Beijing accepted a subordinate position within the existing order. But these days are over. And in fact, we may have only recently begun to realize that, but Beijing has been seriously mulling over the next chapter for over a decade since at least the global financial crisis in 2008 and perhaps even earlier. The Chinese leadership is now eager to use its newfound power to reshape parts of the world order to make it safer for itself, more conducive to its national interests, and non-threatening or even supporting, uh, supportive of the principles on which its domestic system is based. Now, arguably, Beijing faces a number of constraints as it begins its journey to reshape the world. First and foremost, as, I just, uh, as I've just mentioned, China is rising within a system that already exists. It doesn't have the luxury of working on a blank canvas like the US did in 1945. Second, even though China feels threatened by some aspects of the existing system, it also has benefited from it to a large extent. And so destroying it completely would not make a lot of sense even if China had the power to do so. Plus, there are elements of it that Beijing is content with, at least for now, such as the Westphalian concept of absolute sovereignty, for example, or a trading system in which the big markets of advanced industrial democracies remain open. Therefore, Beijing's main task consists of claiming and creating some viable space within the existing system, mostly by pushing back uh, against its most threatening and less desirable features. 
And to this end, China has become much more proactive on the international stage, including within international institutions. And the Chinese leaders have openly indicated their willingness to take the lead in shaping the future of global governance. What are the main features of the existing international system uh, that China is seeking to alter? Their th main targets are, uh, belong to the economic, security, and ideological domains. And incidentally, over the last few months, Beijing has formalized these priority domains in the form of things that you may have heard of, the Global Development Initiative, the Global Security Initiative, and the Global Civilizations Initiative. So first, uh, China wants to become the dominant economic power. It's not content, content anymore to be the world's factory, a position that is the result of its being incorporated into the global economy for the past 40 years. While being consigned to the bottom of the value chain, it wants to become a high-tech powerhouse and wants to vault to the top of the fourth industrial revolution. It wants to be positioned at the center of world economic trade and financial exchanges. Second, Beijing wants an overhaul of its security environment in three main ways. It considers the US alliance system as a deliberate attempt to encircle and contain China's strategic space. Chinese officials now regularly publicly denounce the US alliances in Asia as destabilizing, irresponsible, and as Cold War relics. In addition to declaratory statements, China is actively working to undermine the credibility of the U.S. security guarantees in the region by building up its own conventional and nuclear capabilities to drive a wedge between the U.S. and its regional allies and to keep those allies divided as much as possible. China would like to see a change in the distribution of military power, the U.S. military superiority, its ability to project anywhere uh, project power anywhere on the globe and to develop and operate the most sophisticated weapons system pose a significant challenge to China's security. Therefore, China is actually uh, actively working on improving its own ability to fight and win wars against its most powerful opponent. And finally, Beijing doesn't accept the territorial status quo. It wants to assert and enforce its territorial claims off China's eastern uh, coast in the East and South China Seas and over Taiwan. So that's for the security domain. And third, perhaps to me uh, anyway, most consequential for the future of the world order, China wants to sap the normative foundations of the existing system. The CCP feels threatened by the liberal democratic ideals and principles embodied in the, in the current order, which are at odds with its own ideology, its political foundation, and everything it stands for. The CCP is attempting to undermine the validity of the quote-unquote so-called universal values, that's how the regime calls them, such as human rights and the protection of individual freedoms, by rejecting them as nothing but Western, or even sometimes American values, that are not applicable or viable anywhere other than in the specific confines of Western countries. Beijing considers that these values are imposed on others only as a result of the US domination, sometimes by force, through the instigation of regime change or color revolutions that lead to instability and chaos. On the other hand, China embodies a new form of human advancement, as Xi Jinping said last February. An exemplar uh, that, and I quote, shatters the myth that modernization is equal to westernization, expands the options that developing countries can turn to for their own modernization, and provides a Chinese solution for superior social system that the rest of humanity can explore." End of quote. Beijing is trying to undermine the idea of universal values by claiming every single nation is entitled to its own path, including authoritarian and authoritarianism and repression of dissent if it feels so inclined, without feeling external pressure or lecturing and to establish its own authoritarian model, not only as a legitimate alternative, but a superior one, 
to liberal democracy. This idea is getting much more traction with many regimes around the world than Western capitals seem to realize. So that's for the list of Beijing's main rejections. But what does a China-led world order look like in the end? Well, it's a work in progress, and I'm not sure uh, whether Beijing um, political elites have actually a fully formed vision uh, either. For the following description, I'm weaving together some of the CCP's official pronouncements uh, with discussions within Chinese academic circles, whose main task is precisely to help the Chinese leadership delineate what this new world order could look like. Beijing wants an Asia for Asians, free of US presence and of, of other external Western powers. It calls for the creation of a community of shared future, that's what they call it now, where trade and financial flows, physical connectivity, and knowledge production exchanges are all centered on China, leading to the eventual creation of a subsystem in which China is the biggest, most powerful nation towering over others. In this brave new world, the East, the East is, risen, is risen, the West has declined, China has emerged, and the West has shriveled. This is a zero-sum game vision. The US has become a distant and isolated island, whereas China's influence is thriving along the Belt and Road corridors, spanning over the Eurasian continent, radiating from the Chinese mainland outwards to Southeast Asia, Central Asia, South Asia, the South Pacific, to the shores of the Middle East and the African Atlantic coasts. A massive chunk of the world that Beijing thinks will become the engine of future demographic and global economic growth, even after China itself has ceased to play this role because it won't go, grow as rapidly. A chunk of the world connected by land and sea, voting alongside Beijing in the UN, whose markets are dominated by Chinese companies, whose best and brightest minds are trained in Chinese universities, where the prospect for the development of democratic institutions has been weakened, the legitimacy and power of universal human rights has been eroded, and where China is able to dictate outcomes, impose its will, and constrain the options of other countries, while being looked up to as the success story, the, mod the model to follow the wave of the future. In other words, China is not just looking at Eastern Eurasia as, as its sphere of influence. It's not seeing itself as a regional power of the likes of Iran or Russia. Despite regular official statements scorning the idea, Beijing wants to become a hegemon in its own right, setting the rules, being looked up to. And the place where it can fulfill this vision for a new Sinocentric world order the blank canvas that China can use to this end is the non-Western developing world. This is not the vision of a power on its last legs, but one that reflects self-confidence of its present path and future prospects. Beijing's outlook is global, not regional. It's also comprehensive, not just focused on military power or conquest. It's of course an open question whether Xi Jinping is going to lead his country to a ditch or to a glorious future. It will depend in part on China's own mistakes and on other countries' agency and countervailing uh, responses. It will also depend on how the West reacts. And by West, I don't mean a geographic region, but countries that adhere to liberal democratic principles such as self-government, rule of law, and respect for individual freedom. If the West can't be united in a common purpose to resist against Beijing's agenda, the Chinese leadership will have more opportunities to have its way. How Western powers respond depends on part on how accurate we are in our assessment of what Beijing is trying to do. And I hope that in the last few minutes, I have given you a clearer idea of what it is that China, that China is trying to achieve and that you see why. If it's not prevented, the world would be very different 
from uh, what we have so far been accustomed to. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Dr. Shetha. Great. Um, well, it's great to be here, and even though we didn't really formally coordinate, it turns out that Sarah and Adej and I, I think, will will identify some similar themes, although although some differences, and that's a good thing because real change, I think, starts to happen when you actually have a buildup of similar ideas that move in a certain direction. Um, so I thought initially the topic of, of this panel is challenges to American leadership, and I thought initially, why are we having this conversation? Because in many ways, um, we, and especially probably most of you in this audience, understand how the nature of the world has changed over the past um, decade or how it's been moving toward change and understand the shifts in power that have been taking place. <clears throat> so why the conversation? Because I think essentially there are still these four big areas of uncertainty that we as a country are struggling with. Um, and as, as a result, um, we haven't come to the decisions we need to within these four areas. And so this is where I think I sort of align with, with Sarah's discussion of architecture and Nadezh's discussion of, of China perhaps having less uncertainty in some areas. So initially, um, as I said, we understand, I think, the nature of power and what, what's been happening in the world over the past um, decade, really. Power is shifting. The United States has no longer been a unipolar uh, polar power for some time. Relative military power is, is shifting as well. It's growing in other regions of the world. Um, at the end of the Cold War, we had no peer competitor. Today, clearly, that has all changed. China has a military that threatens East Asia. It's developing its nuclear forces. Um, its power is expanding to other strategic regions of the world. And it's using its power as sort of in very creative ways in terms of its ports and how it's building out an infrastructure and its dual use capabilities. Um, we've seen a Russia capacity, however flawed and certainly clear weaknesses, it still invaded Ukraine and is creating, has created the conditions for a major war in Europe. Um, Iran is projecting power almost now to the Mediterranean. Dynamics there are significant and troubling in terms of its nuclear forces, in terms of uh, some of the capabilities it's developing. And I just saw today in the news, apparently um, another piece of you know good news for us, a, a brand new lithium mine has been found in Iran. So North Korea is developing nuclear weapons as well. Um, economically, these shifts in power that we've seen, the U.S. share of global GDP is eroding. China's economy has grown you know, exponentially since its entry into the World Trade Organization. Um, and even though its economy, there, there are certainly weaknesses. We're going to see probably, obviously, less growth. Um, but still, the, the numbers are, are staggering. Um, one figure is that in 2000, its trade with ASEAN nations was $29 billion. 20 years later, um, it's close to $700 billion dollars. So obviously a lot of the world is highly economically intertwined with China. Um, diplomatic shifts too we've seen largely as a result of kind of the, the dynamics that Nadej described. Um, China's developing um, you know, a very active diplomatic presence around the world. The nature of multilateral institutions is changing. We're sort of holding on to a past, but you're also seeing it in the arguments of the global south and key nations saying, hey, we want a seat at the table, rightfully so, understandably so, but how to do this? Um, and finally, you know, I think there's a sense that we, and these are all things I think we agree with, right, which is an important part of my thesis, and I'll tell you why. There's a sense that, that both Russia and China agree that they want to reshape the world and that they're, they're successful at it. Um, a quote that I came across, which I really found kind of telling, was in March 2023 when President Xi met with President Putin um, at, at a summit. And Xi said, right now there are changes the likes of which we haven't seen for 100 years. And we are the ones driving those changes together. And Putin nodded his head and said, I agree. <laughs> right? So a pretty clear, good statement of intent. So given this fundamental agreement on, on, on the nature of these changes and what we face, 
we still have these uncertainties, these four areas of uncertainty in the technological domain, military, political, and economic. We haven't settled on what to do in each. We haven't developed the operating concepts. And so this is where I maybe differ a little bit on, you know, in Sarah's analysis, maybe, I'm not sure, but sort of a sense of is the architecture that's emerging settled? Have we decided on the Pantheon or on Frank Geary? I would say no, and that's part of the problem. And it's funny because the quote, um, the Wall Street Journal article that you pulled, I pulled that as, as well about, oh, okay. But to me, that indicated not so much a settlement on the French shoring aspect, but more of an unsettled sense of why are we giving the signal that it's okay to South Korea and Taiwan to continue to build uh, semiconductor facilities in China, right? Because, so that creates confusion in my view and confusion sort of in, in my sense of what, what is the export control architecture. So it was a, a good example. So in these uncertainties in technology, um, I don't think we've settled on how to manage uh, the required innovations in these areas, right? We know that we know that, um, that AI is going to change uh, the, the character of war. We know that information operations is a problem, but I don't believe that we've settled on the architectures yet to harness this power. And we don't have the political leadership and haven't had it for a while to settle to basically say, this is the way we need to go. So I think we're very unsettled in this area. I think information operations is a perfect example. We have been discussing information operations and our problems in this domain for 10 years. We do not have an operational concept. Maybe the military does at a tactical level because that is what always comes back to me. But ask the State Department what their operational concept is for information operations when the levers of power, when the platforms of power are all owned externally. We don't have one. Um, I think it's a little bit better, as I said, at the tactical level. So I think similarly, we don't have public-private models that are working. We use the phrase all the time, and yet you have companies out, going out of business all the time because they have this great technology. They can't bring it to DOD to scale. We still see stories all of the time. I'm compiling, you know, a little list so when I feel enraged I can turn to it and see and I'll pick on the army but a good one a recent one that I learned um, so sorry to my army friends it's taken the army 10 years to field group one drones which are available on the internet 10 years for free you could just order them and now they're 17 times the price because of the special specific requirements that have been added into the program so these are stories they abound in every service so to me this suggests we have not settled on the model yet we keep describing the problem we're frustrated by it but we haven't settled i think in many respects china has settled on that model although i'll leave that to, to nadej and, and sarah and yoshi to talk about um, I think within, within sort of the world of politics and democracies, uh, we, we, we're seeing populism, which, which is essentially um, concern about the rules and est of establishment parties, right? Social cohesion is waning, making it much harder and politically more difficult to settle on the model of how to bring us back together. Another, I'm wary of polls, but this one I found particularly disturbing, so I'll throw it out there. There's a recent Rasmussen poll, um, which when p participants were asked if the U.S. Constitution should be mostly or completely rewritten, rewrite the Constitution. 72% of Republicans said no, and only, in my view, 28% of Democrats said no, which means a lot of people think we should rewrite the Constitution. So how do you begin to build social cohesion? How do you rebuild it? What is our concept for doing that? We don't have a concept. We're not in agreement about what our public schools should be teaching. Um, we're not in agreement on, on even you know, the, the, the nature of whether or not our, um, our institutions are strong or weak. So it's, it's hard, I think, we don't, we, don't have, we don't have that concept. And in the economic domain, too, we're really struggling with these operating concepts. Um, globalization, what's globalization 2.0 look like? Does the United States work to build a free trade agreement? Um, with a, What's the successor to the um, TPP? How do we deal with this problem of uh, other countries wanting market access? We haven't settled on it, which is why you see kind of everything is sort of at a standstill. There's IPEF, which is 
the, I forget what it stands for, but it's a new Pacific, a, a framework in the Pacific um, for, for free trade. It's at a standstill. <laughs> uh, it's at a standstill because we don't want to give countries actual market access, which is what they want, and we want to demand that other countries abide by our labor agreements, abide by um, our kind of a lot of our uh, domestic uh, issues. And so they're, like, they're saying, no, don't tell us what to do internally. Uh, so this is at a standstill, and I don't see a way uh, forward in terms of our, our political leaders haven't really defined it. Um, and I think we're less, um, I think there's still, it, even in the industrial policy domain, um, I think we're not really sure what, we, we've passed legislation, but we have huge hurdles to implementation, and we're not really, we don't have the operational plans to implement or the operational concepts or the timelines set out. So again, I think all of this feeds into threats to American leadership because we're playing catch up. We're not leading with a vision and we're not leading with operational concepts. And I love, I'm sorry, I keep re repeating the term, but I think it's really important. And I think it's really a term that really only the military and our government understands. Uh, because without them, you don't get from the tactical to the strategic. And that's what's missing in, in many of these areas. And it's driving a continued American weakness or, or we're not exploiting the opportunities that we could be. And finally, even in the military domain, all you know, what, what you all follow most closely, there are many of these uncertainties. We are now struggling, and it's natural because it's hard to come up with a new concept for deterrence that we hope will hold because we have, obviously, more than two nuclear powers, right? So, so deterrence is just up in the air today, right? We, we're not sure what the new formula is going to look like. Um, and it's, that's pretty dangerous, right? And it's really difficult. Hypersonics, at least, I mean, you know, now three major nuclear powers, us, China, and, um, and Russia, but Iran, North Korea, serious capabilities, hypersonics, asymmetric threats. So it's really, it's really hard. Um, we're, we're struggling with approaches to how do we make our platforms more survivable? What's the right formula between existing platforms and adding on new capabilities to those or scrapping most existing platforms and going for, for new? Um, you know, there are concepts out there, but they haven't been adopted. And we'll hear later from, from General Berger, um, and I, I would say, you know, the Marines actually have said, okay, here we are going to be developing a new operational concept here, and look at the pushback, right, <laughs> right or wrong. But but it's an example of taking a choice to solve a particular problem set. I think um, the military has been criticized, rightly so, by some, like Andy Krepinevich, who's written a great new book on this, where he argues against the tendency to focus on, on, on kind of abstract domains as opposed to specific adversaries. Um, I think China is very specific in looking at what American satellite structures look like, what American forces look like, and China has developed, as, as I'm sure Yoshi is the expert, specific asymmetric capabilities against us, right? We have this tendency, and this has been a tension in our military for some time, the abstract, the capabilities, or the threat-based planning. So I don't, I don't think we're there. And, you know, just to poke a little bit my pet peeve, we don't have an operational concept, but yet we've told DOD that climate is an existential threat for DOD. What's an operational concept to deal with a non-thinking adversary, right? So you need to actually think about that. What are you being asked to do? Can you, so it's, it's just an example. There's a lot of uncertainty out there. Um, but given that, you know, to sort of go to where I began, our heads are not in the sand. We are seeing problem sets um, that we all pretty much agree with, but our focus now has to be on solving the problems. We don't need as much description of the problem set anymore, but institutions like this and back in your wherever you go back to, I think the focus needs to be more and more on how we are going, uh, how we are going to get there. Um, so, you know, some, some answers going forward, and these aren't easy, and I can't, luck, you know, I can't solve the problem now. I don't have the time, but that's sort of a lucky way out because it's actually pretty hard to do all this. Um, but, you know, decide. I mean, I think a focus needs to be the traditional maintaining regional balances of power, right? Just because it's an older concept doesn't mean we reject it. But what's different about it is that we approach those regions in different ways, with new operational concepts, with new approaches, and with a new toolkit. Um, you know, there, there are some, I mentioned some out there, um, actually, um, Admiral Selby and a co-author, Mike Brown, wrote something very interesting recently about distributed deterrence with a concept for what to do. You might not agree with every component, of it, but it's a good example of a concept and thinking through the problem sets. Um, 
Um, there's the, the, the time old, you know, how do we get, be, how do we deal with this problem of speed or lack thereof? Again, we know the problem. I mean, I would venture to say that we need to incorporate time as the more specific element of strategy and account for it. And if you can't get there, don't promise anymore. I have an article coming out on that, which I'll, I'm happy to, um, to send. Um, and so finally, you know, to do all this, we need a fundamental confidence in the United States and in our role in the world. So I think in many ways in these four domains of uncertainty, we're struggling because of that fundamental lack of confidence about what do we want to represent in the world? How do we, when we're dealing with our social cohesion problems, what is our formula for advancing or thinking about human rights in the world, right? I mean, we, it's, it's hard to manage that, and we're seeing the repercussions of that, right? We're seeing that because countries are saying, well, okay, look what happened in Afghanistan, and you're advancing human rights, and look what, you know, I mean, however you feel about, about, about that situation, it's very hard to come up with an operational concept for advancing human rights when millions of women have been re-enslaved in Afghanistan. It's hard. Um, so I'm going to end with a, um, a quote, and I think, you know, and maybe we're overstating China's confidence, but... China, at least externally, as, as Nadej pointed out, is really, is, it's expressing confidence. It's saying to the global south and other countries in the world, our model is the better model. We are not saying that as a country, right? Um, so, I'm sorry, I wish I could end on a, on a higher note. I mean, I do think a lot of this can change. I do think a lot of it can change with leadership and with the right coalitions of leadership. Certainly the outward projection of confidence. There's a lot going for this country. We still have students who want to come here. All of those metrics that you all know and hear. Um, but we have to work harder on some of the concepts and we have to basically stop looking at processes as outcomes and really start focusing on the outcomes and on demanding of our students and of our leaders um, to, to constantly push toward that toward that outcome. Because I think that that's the only way we're going to get around uh, the, the, these, these four uncertainties um, uh, that I described. And that's good because that means there's a lot for all of you uh, in the audience to do. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Yoshihara. Good morning. <clears throat> it's uh, always a real pleasure to be back at the War College and back at the Forum. I hold uh, many fond memories uh, of this institution, uh, having taught here for uh, over uh, 10 years. Uh, this morning, what I'd like to do is to uh, address China's uh, great power military challenge to the United States. Uh, I'd like to discuss how the People's Liberation Army, uh, the PLA, thinks about great power war as a peer rival uh, of the United States. And like the keynote speech uh, by Mary, I'm going to make the case for history. Uh, my talk will be based on my latest uh, CSBA study uh, published uh, in January of this year uh, about Chinese lessons from the Pacific War and how those lessons inform Chinese thinking uh, about a great power war with the United States. Uh, in this study, uh, I survey the extensive Chinese language literature to pinpoint operational insights that Chinese strategists uh, have gleaned from them. I find that Chinese analysts, including those affiliated with the PLA, have carefully studied the Pacific War. Their accounts of the war at sea draw explicit lessons for the future of Chinese warfighting, including war in the information age, modern amphibious landings, land-based maritime strike, and expeditionary logistics. These analyses reveal hints of the PLA's deeply held beliefs about future warfare and of the PLA's enduring weaknesses that it is determined to reverse. So by looking at the Pacific War through Chinese eyes, I argue that the policy community can better appraise Beijing's evolving views of potential great power wars in the Indo-Pacific. So why should we study Chinese views of the Pacific War? Well, first, uh, China is pursuing a world-class military a goal that it seeks to achieve by mid-century. I expect the PLA to emerge as a formidable regional and global power in the coming decades, possessing the means to influence events near and far. And as it does so, it will no longer be an exclusively anti-access area denial force focused on defending the approaches to the homeland. Rather, it will go global 
And as we've already witnessed over the past decade, uh, the PLA is in fact quite busy uh, in various theaters outside of the Western Pacific. And therefore it will acquire the capabilities for sea control and power projection. And in many cases, it will rival the US military. The Pacific War, which featured a war at sea between peer navies, is thus an increasingly relevant historical analogy. Second, we know that the PLA is a learning organization. It has learned vicariously through other people's wars. Uh, this is primarily because it itself has not fought a major conventional combat for many decades. For the most part, the PLA has focused on wars between weak and strong powers, basically the United States beating up on second-rate and third-rate military powers of the past three decades. Um, now, this was entirely understandable then, since uh, the PLA rightly assumed that it would be fighting from a position of relative weakness against the United States. But as the PLA catches up, achieves parity, and even assumes superiority in certain warfare areas uh, over the US armed forces, it is finding that the wars of the last three decades are less relevant to, less relevant to its circumstances. Instead, it is finding that wars between peer great power militaries, like the Pacific War, offer more useful parallels. Now, this is a very huge topic. I had to scope uh, my research down, and so I chose to engage in campaign level analysis. This is important because this is a basic building block of PLA theory and practice. For case selection, I chose Midway, Guadalcanal, and Okinawa. These campaigns illustrate different aspects of the Pacific War, including fleet on fleet engagements, protracted war, amphibious operations, and shore-based firepower. And of course, all of these factors are highly relevant to the PLA today and to potential contingencies in the Indo-Pacific. Drawing from these three cases, I identify common themes that emerged from the writings. And so for the purposes of brevity, um, I'm just gonna focus on five cross-cutting themes. The first is that Chinese analysts have paid very close attention to the role of combined arms tactics and inner service coordination which, of course, substantially boosted U.S. combat power during the Pacific War. Second, Chinese observers appreciate the critical importance of shore-based air power across all three campaigns, which conferred major advantages to the side that possessed this kind of air power. Third, they understand that logistics was absolutely essential to American success in the war. Fourth, Chinese writers see concentration of force uh, as a key ingredient to operational victory. And in this, in this sense, they're actually quintessentially Klaus Witzian. Uh, fifth, they attribute US successes to superior intelligence and reconnaissance, particularly at Midway. What I'd like to do is to dive in deeper on two of these themes. Uh, the first is the role of shore-based air power. At, at Midway, Chinese writers note that US Air Forces at Midway, despite their tactical ineffectiveness, knocked Japanese carrier fleets sufficiently off balance to allow American carrier-based aviation to deliver the decisive blow. At Guadalcanal, Chinese analysts observed that Henderson Airfield provided the basis for different uses of air power, including close air support, air defense, and interdiction. At Okinawa, Chinese observers understand that the inability of US carrier aviation to suppress numerous Japanese airfields on Kyushu allowed Japanese shore-based air power, including kamikazes, to inflict heavy losses. Conversely, US air power established on Okinawa provided different uses of air power, including deep fighter sweeps against Japanese air bases on Kyushu that pushed back Japanese air power away from the theater of operations. The second factor is the role of logistics. At Guadalcanal, Chinese analysts observed that American forward basing, convoying, and effective defense of sea lines of communication by air and by, by sea allowed for the constant flow of material and troops to the island. They note, moreover, the effective interdiction of enemy resupply via shore-based air power and artillery further cemented America's logistical advantages. This superior American performance contrasted sharply with poor Japanese logistics which were ill-equipped to resupply their forces on the island, a predicament that was made worse by American interdiction. At Okinawa, Chinese observers were very impressed, in fact, frankly, in awe of US forward basing at the Kurama Islands, the entire logistical infrastructure across the Pacific, including uh, the anchorage at Ulithi, uh, the at-sea replenishment fleet, the massive amphibious assault force, 
and the follow-on resupply efforts that kept the ground offensive going. All of these, to Chinese eyes, were absolutely extraordinary. One scholar described it as a miracle. Chinese analysts also engaged in counterfactual analysis, which is to assess alternative courses of action by either side that could have changed the course of the conflict. Such critical analysis, in my view, gives some hints as to the quality of Chinese thinking. So first counterfactual. If the Imperial Japanese Navy had concentrated forces at Midway, rather than disperse forces against the Aleutians and against Midway itself, it might have had overwhelming power to defeat the American carrier fleet. Second counterfactual, if Japan had not contested the Solomons, rather than pour resources into an untenable and overextended position, it might have been able to withdraw to more defensible positions uh, to impose more cost on the incoming Americans. Third counterfactual, if Admiral Mikawa had pressed his attack against vulnerable American transports at Guadalcanal, rather than withdraw his fleet after inflicting heavy losses on the Allied fleet, Japan might have significantly disrupted the logistical foundations that contributed to later American success. Last counterfactual, if Japan had conducted an all-out all early air assault against US forces assembling around Okinawa and had conducted a ground offensive to push American landing forces back into the sea, Japan might well have bloodied the Americans even more. I think this counterfactual is rather problematic, and I'll come back to it. Chinese writings have furthermore explicitly linked their analyses to the future of PLA warfighting. To the Chinese, US intelligence and reconnaissance at Midway confirms the essential characteristics of informationized warfare in the future. The role of US seaborne radar pickets at Okinawa as an air defense layer illustrates to PLA analysts the centrality of commanding the electromagnetic domain. The importance of shore-based air power parallels key elements of the PLA's doctrine of a joint fire power strike campaign. When Chinese analysts describe the landings and counter landings at, Okina uh, at uh, Guadalcanal, they are reminded of the importance of defending against Taiwanese counter landing operations in an invasion scenario. When they look at logistics, they see how the Chinese Navy should emulate the US Navy in conducting future far seas operations. Admiral Mikawa's mischance against American logistical vulnerabilities at Guadalcanal reinforces the PLA's principle and its own thinking about future counter-logistics campaign. Now, I conclude the report with some thoughts about the need to, in, to sort of further interrogate these Chinese lessons. Uh, I think it's important not to take all of these lessons at face value. We should seek to understand why Chinese writer, uh, writers have chosen to focus on some lessons, but perhaps ignoring others. Many of these lessons speak well to PLA's strengths, such as informationized warfare and shore-based firepower. In other words, they're drawing these lessons because they're reinforcing existing beliefs and concepts. I speculate in the report on whether the harsh judgments rendered against the Japanese reflect a kind of prejudice that in turn reveal an analytic blind spot among Chinese analysts on things related to Japan, both past and present. The counterfactual analysis can frequently can be disconnected from the larger strategic picture. Chinese strategists, for example, do not take the extra analytical step to consider what might have happened had the Imperial Japanese Navy won at Midway. Could the Japanese have gone further? Chinese analysts do not really address that question. Some counterfactuals go entirely unexplained, in particular, the highly problematic assertion that Japan should have gone on an early counteroffensive at Okinawa. Here, too, I speculate whether this view about conducting this all-out attack really reflects the PLA's own preferences for striking first in the context of its active defense doctrine. In other words, the PLA in this case is essentially projecting its own beliefs onto its own interpretation of the past. Uh, we have another counterfactual re repeated across multiple writings is the idea that Admiral Mikawa missed that opportunity to wreck vulnerable American logistics. I think this is interesting because this notion parallels another more recent PLA counterfactual view that Saddam Hussein missed a similar opportunity to attack US forces assembling in Saudi Arabia during the early phases of the first Gulf War. Again, this seems to be another kind of projection. 
Finally, I acknowledge that there's certainly a difference between knowing a lesson and truly learning a lesson, right? For the PLA or for any organization for that matter, to learn in a meaningful way, these lessons need to be institutionalized. And this is a process that's frequently opaque to us outsiders, particularly with regard to the PLA. So I caution readers to be aware of inferring too much from these lessons. Let me conclude by talking about a few other lessons. Uh, I came across cases in which the Chinese are learning from American learning. Uh, they appear quite interested in examining what lessons we're learning from our own conflict. Uh, I came across a Chinese translation of a student paper by a Marine officer who had attended the Maritime Advanced Warfighting School here at the Naval War College. And what was the paper that so attracted this Chinese analyst's attention? The relevance of the Battle of Wake Island to the Marine Corps' recent operational concepts. Interesting to say the least. So be aware, uh, they're reading your papers. Um, <laughs> let me conclude by tying this research to my learning here uh, at the War College, uh, particularly when I taught the Strategy and Policy course. Uh, the idea for this research uh, can actually be traced to my time here. The Pacific War case study, particularly the mini case study on the Guadalcanal campaign, struck me as potentially relevant for future warfare in the Indo-Pacific. And I found that PLA analysts appeared to agree with me, uh, which led me to keep digging. And that was how I stumbled across a large untapped literature in China that became the basis of this report. So I'm particularly pleased to share my findings with you uh, based on what I learned here. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thanks to our panelists coming in right on time. We have about 20 minutes for questions. Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming here and taking my question. I'm Tony King from Naval Engineering Systems Command. Uh, when thinking about executing a strategy and the means to do it, resource constraints, I feel one of the resource constraints that is kind of given short shrift recently is human capital. Um, you know, what we're seeing, you know, I hear people in the national security spaces say, you know, we're, we're really trying to execute a, a defense strategy that costs 1.2 billion, or 1.2 trillion, and we're trying to do it with 800 billion dollars. But if we were given another 400 billion tomorrow, I, I don't think we could execute it. If we made the decision tomorrow that we're going to build 10 Virginia-class submarines a year, even if we had the shipyards to do it, we couldn't do it. And we're seeing these constraints imposed both on us and on industry as we're both ch uh, chasing the same talent pool. Uh, so my question for any one of you, pro probably Dr. Krebs, but anybody could probably you know, give you your thoughts on, is, is this a concern that is percolating up through the national security, you know, through the blob, right? Is, is it widely acknowledged as this is something we're gonna run into? You know, there's a reason so we, we offshore a lot of our manufacturing, we just don't have the <laughs> you know, we don't have the human capital to do it. So just, just wondering your thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a huge question. And it's something I've written about but didn't have a chance to touch on in these remarks, which is that this idea of reshoring manufacturing requires human capital. Intel has said that they don't have the manpower to build these plants in Ohio. And that's just one small example, but it's representative of a bigger problem. And so I think that, you know, in this uh, science, uh, Chips and Science Act, they're trying to build a pipeline of high tech kind of STEM oriented people, but that's only part of the issue. So you need both the kind of um, high skilled and lower skilled labor. And I think that's a real deficit that is not receiving uh, the attention it, it deserves. And I think it percolates through all different facets. You know, to your point, it's, it's happening in industry, it's happening across the economy. So I think that's a limitation that is certainly important that we didn't touch on until now. So I appreciate that. And I'd just like to add, I mean, I think that's a perfect example of the operational concept problem set, right? So we say we want to achieve a certain set of objectives, but haven't figured out the alignments of new types of certification programs, of specific companies that can work in states to increase throughput of people. I mean, there are ways to do this, but we're just not doing it. And if you go back um, to... to continue to be the, um, in, in 2009, if you go back to President Obama's statements across 
Obama all the way through today, all presidents, they've identified the same set of problems. And in fact, the numbers in terms of STEM have continued to decline and where the United States finds itself, you know, in sort of international rankings. So it's just to say we are repeating the same sets of problems, but if we had actually created operational plans to do something differently 10 years ago, we'd be at a different place today. So, and I think some of the tech community is looking to external visas for this, and that's fine, but we can't give up on our educational system here too. And we have opportunities now uh, to do things differently, um, so. Pardon? I mean, I think there's time to do so if we actually work really quickly with industry and take a state-based approach and, and also change the way the government allows for funding of different types of educational institutions. So right now it's much harder for students who want to do certification programs to get loans, right? That's, that's all biased toward higher education. We need different kinds of workers, but certainly there could be, I think there could be ways. Hi, good morning. Commander Stephen Collins, thank you so much for your uh, time here today. You've really, I've been thinking a lot this whole panel, so you present us with a lot of significant artifacts. Um, and I've heard terms, I wrote down some, global power, regional power, hegemon, near peer, eroding current international order, superiority, economic leader, our model is better, competitor, adversary. Are these adjectives appropriate for a country benefiting from developing nation status? And if yes, why? And if no, how would the premise of your uh, presentations change if China has to bear the requirements of a developed nation? Would our disadvantage change? And um, what would change economically or, and uh, as well as budgetarily, budgetary assessments? Thank you. I think that's actually changing now. So I think you're, um, I think it's changing on the Hill, right? There actually, there's an effort now to, re, uh, to remove that status uh, because of the benefits it confers, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a very recent, I, I saw something like a couple of days ago that uh, on the Hill they are going to question the um, developing nation status. I'm, I'm not sure about the impact that this is going to have. I'm, I'm just spending my time you know, trying to understand what Beijing thinks, not what the Americans think, so I can't. <laughs> That's my limitation. <laughs> it will have an impact in, in, the, in, in the World Bank and some of the multilateral organizations and the way those incentives are, are set up. So if, the, if, if, it's, um, if its status changes. Good morning, John Davidson, Department of the Army Civilian. Uh, first of all, great presentations, uh, very thought provoking, so thank you. Uh, my question is for Ms. Roland and Dr. Yoshihara, and it uh, ties back to the analogy that you presented to us earlier, Ms. Roland, about how China sees the, the developing world kind of as a, a blank canvas upon which to put its premature. So what I would like to ask is, can either of you foresee a point in the not too distant future where China makes sweeping claims of sovereignty over the Eastern Indian Ocean region, similar to what it's done with the South China Sea, based upon dubious legal justifications, dubious history, and attempts to back those claims up with the development and fielding of a large Indian Ocean fleet that would be based out of, say, Kyokfu in Myanmar, and sustained through the China-Myanmar economic corridor. Thank you for uh, this question. I think you know, the blank canvas is not necessarily going to be um, one full of uh, military deployments or um, even um, boots on the ground necessarily. Uh, I think the way Beijing is approaching it, at least to this point, you know, we'll see how this grows as their military capabilities uh, grow. But for now, it's more, it's everything 
it's a very comprehensive vision that starts with economic influence that can be used both as incentive and leverage against the um, decision making of those countries. Um, this is what the Belt and Road is about. It's not a development plan, it's an influence plan. Um, it's, uh, it then evolves into political cooperation and training, uh, so that seeps into the ideological governance part. Um, it uh, evolves into um, you know, diplomatic um, support for China in international institutions on things that are on, on aspects that are growing. You know, it used to be Taiwan, uh, Xinjiang, Tibet, um, but now it really is about the core um, uh, vision for what the what the, the values that un and the norms that underpin the current uh, order should look like, and this uh, effort to push, you know, the right to development uh, that is very appealing to many of the developing countries as well. Um, the degree of um, Chinese penetration of these societies is usually under um, scrut scrutinized. Uh, if you look on, uh, at the detailed level of how uh, they are uh, developing what they call sharing experience programs, um, uh, both with um, at the you know, level of uh, uh, educational, higher education, uh, media, health, um, anything you can think of really, um, to train um, the sort of rising future generations of these societies, it's, it's really important. So, and then when you think about actual boots on the ground deployment, um, I know that over here you think about naval bases. Uh, I think the way they think about it is more but Toshi knows better than I do, uh, more in terms of uh, dual-use access and dual-use facilities um, where, you know, I've just concluded a, um, a research project on, on, on the way the Chinese elites think about the African continent, like at the strategic level. And you can see that they're sort of building those very integrated... Uh, knitted together uh, hubs um, that um, connect railways to ports to industrial zones um, that are purposely for commercial purposes. But you can see that actually next to the industrial zone you have hospitals. Uh, and then uh, those pipelines and, and trains can deliver whatever you need to replenish your ships, perhaps, later on. So you, you need to try to think about what this blank canvas could look like, and it could be very different from what we're used to. It's, uh, I was uh, reading just yesterday before coming here a discussion among, um, like, strategic planners in Beijing that dated 10 years ago, and they were saying, you know, we cannot become colonialists, but sort of this is what we need to do, right, to continue to, to expand our, our, um, our, our influence. Um, so to me, the question is how they're going to square that circle of the need to expand uh, under... Uh, a context of a 21st century uh, um, context, yeah, where where the the things are that are acceptable are very different. Um, but I'll, I'll turn to um, to Toshi for the for the Indian Ocean part. Sure. So I'll I'll talk a little bit about uh, Chinese military strategy within the larger architecture uh, that was just talked about, um, and I think. Um, we typically think of sort of China's, mar the key maritime domains as being those in its you know, immediate periphery, the Yellow Sea, East China Sea, and the South China Sea. But I think increasingly we do need to think about other sub-maritime theaters uh, beyond uh, what the Chinese call the Near Seas. And I think one sub theater is the Bay of Bengal, or the Northern Indian Ocean area, uh, because that is in many ways uh, one of the uh, 
uh, thoroughfares that Chinese naval and air forces have to pass through in order to reach out into the broader oceans of the, in, uh, of the Indian Ocean and, and beyond. Um, I think it's also important to think about the Bay of Bengal as actually a, a part of China's thinking about homeland defense. Uh, so uh, in their um, science of military strategy document that was published now 10 years ago, actually describes China's homeland defense as ha having a strategic arc that covers not only large parts uh, of the Western Pacific, uh, but also uh, the Northern Indian Ocean to include the Bay of Bengal, which means that for PLA planners, they believe that their forces have to be able to conduct what they call deterrent operations as far out as the Bay of Bengal in order to defend the Chinese homeland. And so I think as the PLA continues to modernize and continues to acquire power projection capabilities, their definition, their, the, the, their, uh, the, the geographic scope of what they consider to be homeland defense will continue to, to expand. And so I think it's worth thinking about some of these sub-theaters that we typically exclude you know, when we talk about China's defense strategy. One, one thing I may add is also when you, when you see this sort of maritime expansion, you, you, you may understand why it is so important for Beijing to be like, closely knitted to Russia because if the northern continental theater is insecure, then you cannot progress to the, uh, to the maritime domain. And so this is, it's not the only reason, obviously, but it's one of the reasons why having, you know, being in the lockstep with, with Russia is so important because you secure the, the, the continental uh, side. All right, I think we have time for one, maybe two more. Up front here. Uh, good morning, Randy Johnson, the uh, foundation. Appreciate your being here. This is a question I asked yesterday, but because of your additional insights, I'd like to ask it again. How do the Russians and the Chinese view the United States? What do, what do they see as our strengths, and what do they see as our vulnerabilities? I think... I'm not sure about Russia. Uh, this is not my area of expertise, but um, um, China sees the U.S. both as the model and the um, hated model. Uh, it's a love and hate, uh, I think, relationship. Um, it's, uh, it's the only thing that stands in the way of uh, China's own ambitions. Um, and I think that no matter what the U.S. is doing, um, Beijing will always see the U.S. as the main adversary um, because it's not about what you're doing. It's about what you are. Um, and it's because it's completely antithetical to, antithetical to the CCP's own ideology. Um, so this is, this is what is in their, is and has been in their mind. Um, they're afraid of U.S. power. Um, and also um, jealous of it. And they're not necessarily trying to model themselves on the U.S., but they certainly are, are as, as Toshi just mentioned, you know, they're studying a lot of what you are doing um, and uh, learning a lot from it. But the, the, the point of my question, do they see us as, a, you know, a, a, a power that's, declining? Do they see corruption within our society? Do they see vulnerabilities? And what do they, you know, that kind of thing. I, we always, when we have these discussions, we always do it from our perspective, which is reasonable. But what are they thinking about us? Yeah, they, they, they see that the U.S. has started to decline a while ago already. Like the relative decline of the U.S. has started. And the, the main, like the, the marker uh, was really 2008-2009 with the global financial crisis. This is where they saw, or that's how they read it, it's that the, the, the liberal uh, democratic capitalist model was on its last legs and had shown um, a lot of uh, its problems and issues. And this is where they start to see that their own trajectory is going up. So y you, you see regularly uh, Chinese leadership 
an elite saying that the, you know, um, the, the East is rising and the West is declining. Um, on the other hand, they don't really see that this decline, U.S. decline is going to be very sharp. It's going to be a long protracted process, which is going to give, and their own rise is going to be a long protracted process as well. They see all sorts of problems, the rise of populism, um, the, uh, the frictions inside of uh, the U.S. society, uh, the decline of soft power, um, uh, just like what Nadia was mentioning, you know, it's it's not the shining light uh, anymore. Uh, the discontent. Um, the um, I think what's interesting to me is also that many of these assessments are actually a reflection of what they hear you say about yourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that goes to the point that Nadia was, was talking about, which is we need to regain self-confidence, you know, after all, this is, this is uh, the United States, damn it. Uh, so it's a French saying that, okay? So I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, not, a, I'm not a US passport holder. Uh, uh, but so, yeah, you know, uh, and I think that they, they can, they, they read a lot of, uh, you know, the, the media and how people talk about it here. And so their assessment is partially a reflection of how you see yourselves. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so I'm just going to take a step back and sort of think about how this uh, helps in the formulation of our strategy, which is to understand areas where the Chinese overestimate us and to understand areas where they underestimate us. And I think those types of misassessments can be highly informative in terms of our strategy formulation. What can we do to essentially surprise them in areas where they persistently underestimate us? Where are areas where we can bluff our way through if they overestimate us in certain areas. I think those are, those are good ways of thinking about strategy formulation. Uh, I do want to talk about uh, one sort of sharp apparent asymmetry uh, that uh, has informed uh, Chinese writings about the Pacific War, which I think is actually quite informative, which is the command culture and, and the ability to deal with uncertainty between the Imperial Japanese Navy and the U.S. Navy. And the metaphor that was used by one analyst is that uh, the uh, Japanese command culture is like a highly choreographed uh, uh, Western opera, whereas the American command culture is like jazz blues. Uh, in other words, um, the U.S. military performs very well, especially at a time when the plan goes out the window, right? When it's time to improvise, when it's time to adapt, when it's time to make adjustments to uncertainty and risk, that's where, in many ways, the U.S. military stood out during the Pacific War and in other conflicts. Uh, so it seems to me what, what is interesting is that the PLA appears to be aware of this asymmetry because the PLA is, in many ways, very much like uh, the Imperial Japanese Navy, a tendency to choreograph, the tendency to, to have very structured plans that are highly inflexible. So understanding those strengths and weaknesses uh, based on their assessment of the past might give us hints about PLA weaknesses that we could potentially exploit, right? So it, if indeed their own description of their weaknesses are in fact true, then we should think about ways to spring surprises on them to put pressure on uh, an inflexible, more sort of doctrinaire command structure. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to cut us off there. We are at time. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists one more time. Thank you.